Hi folks, this is Kim Gridley. Thanks for joining us today for our producing and marketing non-timber forest products put on by the Capital RCD. We're joined today by Tracy Coulter from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources here in Pennsylvania. She's going to be speaking to us about small-scale chestnut production. And before we get started, um, I'm going to let Susan Richards of Capital RCNB kind of introduce the program and herself. And I just want to let um, you folks know that we are getting some reverb there, uh, either Susan or Tracy. So I'm going to go on mute, and Susan, you take it away. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Kim, and thank you very much, Tracy, for um, providing us with this presentation today. This is the third of four of a four-part series on small-scale. Um, I'm sorry, on, on non-timber um, agroforestry, and um, I wanted to just mention our funders who for this project are the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Capital RCND has been working with the NRCS on a number of projects, and um, I'd like to welcome you to visit our website at capitalrcd.org uh, to look at other educational programs we have to offer, including videos and also um, tapes of the previous two webinars. And um, again, thank you for joining and taking your time here at lunch. Um, and thank you, Tracy, and I'll let you go from here. Great. Thank you, Susan. And thanks to Capital RCND, NRCS, and Kim Gridley for making this happen. Um, I'm really excited to talk about small ch scale chestnut production today. It's one of my one of my passions. It's something that I've been interested in for many years. Uh, I've been actually a member of the American Chestnut Foundation for 25 years and have learned a little bit of, uh, along the way and learned even more in preparing this presentation. So uh, let's get started. Overview of what I'm going to be talking about are chestnut species and a little history. There's a lot of history of chestnut use and um, the uh, the demise of the chestnut here in Pennsylvania. I'm going to talk about site selection, where's the best kind of soils and other conditions to plant chestnuts. Uh, seedlings versus cultivars, what, what is going to work best in your operation? Uh, talk a little bit about orchard design and establishment. How is that the layout going to look? Um, how you can integrate some other species while your chestnuts are getting established. Um, pest management, that is a problem that's on everyone's mind, as well as diseases. Clearly, the chestnut blight is the foremost concern, but there are others. I'm going to present a case study, and in, in that process, we're going to talk a little bit about harvesting, handling, and processing. And finally, talking about markets and marketing. Um, there, there's a whole lot involved. It depends on the scale at what you want to work, but there are a few critical uh, junctures where um, there are, you have to do certain processes. So starting off with chestnut species, the first one is the American chestnut. This is a native species, three nuts to a burr. Um, Allegheny chinkapin is another one that folks are not often familiar with. It's a, a small, more shrubby tree, one nut to the burr, very sweet um, and flavorful. Ozark chinkapin, not native to Pennsylvania, but it is in the same family as the American and the Allegheny chestnuts. So one of the, the, the crucial um, issues is that we imported a lot of chestnuts. And you look at the dates when they arrived here. Uh, the European chestnut arrived in 1773, so even before we became a country. Japanese chestnut was in 1876, and the Chinese chestnut was in 1912. A couple of, of uh, hybrids that may come up in the literature that you uh, may have heard about. The colossal is the European um, cross with Japanese. And the paragon is the American cross with the European. 
why did, did folks uh, import different nuts? We had native nut trees, but if you look at these trees, the nuts, excuse me, from left to right, on the left-hand side is American chestnut, followed by, uh, to the right, by the Chinese chestnut, then the European chestnut, and finally the Japanese chestnut. So there's a big variability in size. Uh, and if you're looking for a larger uh, nut, then importing these other chestnuts made sense. Again, the Allegheny chinkapin is a shrub. If you look at the image on the left-hand side, at the, the top of that image is a, an Allegheny chinkapin burr. Compare it to the chestnut burr below it. It's a much smaller, smaller um, nut. It's a smaller plant. But from what I understand, a lot of people really enjoy the, the fruit. American chestnut, this is one that we still find in the understory of our forest. Uh, it's not that uncommon. What is uncommon is to find a chestnut, an American chestnut that, that's actually producing uh, nuts because, um, because of the blight, the tree is diminished. It will grow to a certain extent, succumb to the blight, die back to the ground and re-sprout. And the reason it can do that is because the roots don't actually die. And like many, many trees in its family, which is the same family as the oak, it, it re-sprouts readily. So it'll re-sprout, it becomes sort of a shrubby understory tree, does not get enough light to produce nuts unless it's released. This is just uh, an image, or a couple of images, showing you uh, about the heyday of the American chestnut. The image on the left was harvesting chestnuts on uh, Fairmount Park. And here on the right is an image of kids just throwing out a sheet, shaking the nuts down, and gathering them. So it was a, it was a fall tradition here in Pennsylvania. So we brought over the European chestnut. The European chestnut is very similar um, in many ways to the American chestnut. Um, the, the nut is larger and it, as all chestnuts, it hybridizes readily um, with uh, other species. So one of the, the sort of the tragedies of the chestnut industry here in Pennsylvania was this Sober Chestnut Grove Stock Farm, just located in Irish Valley. Um, the, as you can see, the farm was um, begun in 1895, but in the course of those ensuing years, the chestnut blight was discovered in New York and finally made its way to Pennsylvania where the um, the, the blight actually caused the failure of that operation. But what was interesting about this particular um, operation is if you look at the image on the lower uh, right, you can see there's a forest in the background. Um, Dr. Sober was a, a forester, he was involved in forestry, and he cut down chestnuts and as I mentioned, they, they readily coppice. And so what he did is he grafted this selected um, hybrid or the Paragon chestnut to the American chestnut sprouts. And, and the image on the left, he brought European grafters and workers um, to help work his fields because at that point, um, a lot of the, the chestnut production was in Europe and these folks were experienced with that. But unfortunately, um, yeah, um, the, the blight really ruined this operation. But you saw the, the, they closed the Sober Farm in 1913, but we saw that the Chinese chestnut was introduced in uh, 1912. The Chinese chestnut the one that we often see here uh, is Melissima. It 
tends uh, to have more of a uh, open orchard-like growth, but that was because it was selected specifically for nut production, specifically for um, to be to be harvested easily. Um, the nut the the nuts are medium large. It is probably uh, arguably um, the source of most of chestnut production, at least in the eastern United States. So when we're selecting a species, you heard uh, about a number of different species and, and hybrids and combinations. What you really want to think about here in Pennsylvania, because the blight is so prevalent, is the resistance of the tree you're planting to the blight. So Chinese chestnut is the most resistant, followed by J Japanese, European, and then American. And I put in brackets chinkapin because that's also susceptible to the chestnut blight. But we also, when we're thinking about hybrids, have to think about the cold hardiness. Um, Chinese uh, hybrids and Chinese chestnuts tend to be more cold hardy than Japanese. What about consistent production? Uh, what species is going to produce consistently given um, erratic weather conditions? Um, a late frost or an early spring combined with a late frost, what's going to happen? Um, nut quality, what is the flavor? What is it you're looking for? Are you looking to produce more um, flour or nuts for uh, fresh consumption? And also the growth habit. Um, do you want a spreading tree? Do you want one that's more upright? Uh, what is it that you're really looking for? Um, but don't discount planting American chestnuts. This is an orchard in Western Pennsylvania in Mercer County. Uh, the gentleman that planted this um, planted a number of different sourced uh, seeds of American chestnuts in this field. And this field has, these trees have been growing, dying back, as I said, and then re-sprouting um, for several decades and producing thousands of nuts. Um, the orchard is not very, um, it's a little unsightly, it's unkempt, but it produces a lot of nuts and it produces a lot of feed that draws wildlife from all over. So if you have an open field and it's away from, you don't mind looking at something like this, I would suggest planting American chestnuts. They're small, they're easily um, palatable to wildlife and um, we're preserving that heritage. So chestnut pollination. Um, one of the things I like to think about uh, with chestnuts is I look forward to the 4th of July because you see what I, I kind of visualize as fireworks in the trees. And that's where we can identify chestnuts and bloom. One of the things that my grandsons learned early on is looking around, seeing those trees that are um, just covered with those white catkins uh, in June. And depending on the species, depending on the site, um, they can blossom anywhere between um, late May, early June to early July. Uh, chestnuts are wind and insect pollinated. Um, not so dependent on bees. I've seen um, all kinds of insects, beetles, um, even earwigs high up in the canopy while we were pollinating, uh, hand pollinating trees for breeding. So there are a lot of different insects that are uh, that feed on on both the pollen um, of the of the tree. Um, desired pollinator trees should be within 200 feet. Now that's optimal. I've heard longer distances cited, but if you're looking for consistent production. Uh, you want to have a pollinator within 200 feet. And cross-pollination between species, as I said earlier, occurs readily if flowering times coincide. So it's all dependent on, on that timing. It's the, 
sometimes a Chinese may um, be receptive much earlier than an American or vice versa. And so that pollination doesn't necessarily happen. Um, the, the image that's in, um, embedded is what we call a, a bisexual catkin. And so the ones that you see that are very prominent, those are primarily um, male catkins. This one has both uh, male and female flowers. And the little kind of cone-shaped, pineapple-shaped, um, uh, well, they're, they're flowers on this catkin are the females. And those are what will eventually become your burrs. I, I just stuck this in because it just um, really exemplifies how glorious those flowers can be. Not everybody is a fan. Some folks say they smell like bleach. Others say they smell like old rags. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm sort of agnostic. They don't bother me much. So site selection. Um, chestnuts grow best in dry, sandy, gravelly, or loamy soil. Um, avoid clay soils. You don't want a pan and you don't want um, something that's going to be wet. Uh, they prefer slightly acidic soils with a pH between 4.5 and 6.5, and they're intolerant of limestone soils. Now, I've seen chestnuts grow in limestone areas, but that's not the optimum uh, location for uh, production. Site access. Um, this was just one of those, I don't believe this, moments. This uh, is a chestnut tree. It's a Native American that's growing in a rock dump. That's just, there doesn't, there doesn't appear to be any soil. So it's probably well drained, but um, trying to access that to manage it, to harvest it is really um, sort of a ridiculous thought. So what you're looking for is gently sloped or well-drained bottomlands that allow good access. And again, avoid flood-prone sites. Um, wet feet are not, um, not a good thing for chestnuts. Shade tolerance. I mentioned earlier that chestnuts are shade tolerant. Um, they won't, but they won't flower in shade. So they can hang out a long time in the understory. And when there's a disturbance, whether it's harvesting or wind or ice, um, and the chestnuts are released and they get that sunshine, that sunlight, they will uh, go into production. So for optimum growth and production, plant your chestnuts in full sunlight. Um, chestnuts can easily be grown from seed. You collect the seeds in the fall. You heat treat to control weevils, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, stratify them in dampened but not wet peat moss. So um, if you can squeeze water out of the peat moss, it's too wet. So you want to just have a little moisture. And one of the benefits of the peat moss is it helps to prevent um, mold from growing on the chestnuts. They are very prone to moldy, uh, to becoming moldy. So, and you want to store those at 34 to 40 degrees. Do not freeze them. And you want to keep them stratified for 60 to 90 days. Um, I've seen chestnuts, oh gosh, I had some in my pocket probably for three months. And um, it was a, a rubber jacket, so it was pretty, uh, didn't dry out really fast. I planted them and they actually grew, but I would not recommend that as a stratification uh, strategy. Um, radicals will emerge during stratification or the cold storage. So the, the, the roots will emerge. And when you are ready to plant them either into pots or into the soil once it's ready to be worked. Um, plant them a half inch to an inch in depth and, and make sure that the radical or the root is facing downward. So seedlings are cultivars. Uh, in preparing for this uh, presentation, I 
did a lot of reading. And one of the best sites uh, was the Northern Nut Growers Association provides a list of sources for chestnut trees. Um, there are arguments for both ways. Uh, seedlings are readily available. They're inexpensive. You can produce them readily if you have a seed source. Um, it's hard to predict how they are going to perform, um, when they are going to bloom, but cultivars are clones. So these are um, grafted uh, seedlings, if you will, um, of select trees that are known for specific uh, qualities, either nut production or cold tolerance or uh, growth habit, easily pruned, easily, uh, whatever, can, whatever uh, qualification or um, that you're looking for is uh, something that you can select for with a cultivar much more easily than um, for a seedling. But um, I would recommend uh, looking at this uh, site and we'll talk more about resources later on. Orchard design and establishment. So spacing, you could, should start with a 40 by 40. If you're going to be using equipment, uh, mechanically harvesting, running tractors, mowing, making sure that you have enough space to operate and not damage the trees. A 30 by 30 or 50 trees per acre is adequate for small scale production where most of the work is going to be done by hand. And um, that's something else that we're going to talk about later. So irrigation, um, consider micro irrigation systems like drip or micro sprinklers to guard against drought that could diminish survival or yield. Um, there are certain times in the, the course of the year where water is especially critical. It's very critical through establishment. It's critical through nut production and uh, irrigation. If you're uh, looking at uh, a production system is something you should consider. Fertilization um, in the spring only, but as always, anytime you go to plant something, have your soil tested. And when you submit your soil samples, uh, tell uh, the lab that you want uh, to be tested for, for oak. So basically they can give you results that are appropriate for oak, which is fine for chestnut, but I don't think they have a separate category for chestnut. So things like uh, necessary amendments like lime, phosphorus, or potassium uh, would be uh, indicated by that soil test. So orchard design and establishment, what is it that you want to do? Um, I already showed you that, <laughs> that uh, American chestnut orchard. The image on the left is a farm. Uh, you can tell that the ground is really pretty clear. Um, these are young chestnuts that are not yet in the production. Um, they're being established. And the farmer, because he wanted to have some income um, before the chestnuts actually came into production, planted raspberries in an intercrop um, situation. Those chestnuts aren't really uh, shading those, those, those um, raspberries uh, and they will be coming into production. The other thing you might notice in this image is the white paint. And any of you that are orchardists or familiar with sun scald would know that that's one of the um, preventative measures that uh, you can take when you're establishing young trees. Chestnuts are prone to sun scald. Uh, so that's why this farmer painted them. The image on the right is a 60-year-old planning uh, in Schuylkill County. Uh, it's managed very differently. Um, but again, you can see that the, the ground is, is pretty clear. 
one of the the comments that I read that was kind of amusing and kind of a no brainer in a sense is in backyard and homestead plantings, avoid planting chestnuts in places where pets and children are likely to play. So if you're going to plant a few chestnuts in your backyard, put them back where the kids aren't likely to, to roll around and jump in leaf piles. Um, they can be they can be pretty pretty prickly. Weed manages management is crucial. Uh, keep at least a two to three foot diameter weed free area around seedlings and saplings, and that can be managed in, a, in several different ways. Um, landscape fabric or mulch can be used, but many will harbor rodents that can girdle trees, and and that's a real issue in especially in field locations. Trees must be protected when applying um, herbicides or mowing or string trimming. So we'd recommend a two foot tree shelter um, that's around that little seedling. And even if you don't have the five foot, even if you have a fenced area, um, they'll protect those little uh, seedlings from damage. And of course, always follow directions on pesticide labels. So speaking of pests, mammals are a huge problem um, for young tree establishment. Anyone that's planted trees and buffers or anywhere basically um, is familiar with, with deer, the deer issue. People either love or hate tree tubes but some sort of protection is, is pretty much mandatory in most of the state. Um, one of the things that some people use um, are these tall, uh, tall tree tubes. Another one is a short tree tube that's actually um, inserted into the ground an inch or two to prevent voles from getting underneath and, and girdling the seedlings. And then surrounding that um, that whole uh, tree tube with a cage that will prevent larger herbivores, um, deer and uh, even rabbits from getting in there. Um, bears are a, a, another problem because of the insects that uh, will uh, nest in their hornets, wasps, and the bears will go in and um, tear the tubes apart in order to get to um, those, those bees. The other thing that um, when you're using, especially the tall tree tubes, is to make sure that until the tree itself is very close to the top of that tree tube, make sure that you have a net over it because um, cavity nesting birds like bluebirds are often um, trapped in tubes and can't escape. So putting a net on that um, helps prevent that. Um, tubes are being designed now where they're, um, they're uh, scarified or striated inside to allow for the birds to escape. But it's, it's kind of hard business when you're out checking your tubes and you find a couple of bluebirds. Um, so um, then on the right is a fence, which is, uh, gee, if you can afford it, that's a great way to protect um, your orchard. The other thing within that orchard, you could also use those small tubes, just uh, the short tubes, just to facilitate weed management. Even with all these protections, even when the trees grow, um, their orchards, bears have gotten into orchards to go after the, the trees and they will damage the trees. Buck rub is another issue. So not to discourage you, but you, you always have to be on the lookout for um, ways to protect your trees. Pest management insects, oh gosh. Um, they're kind of the usual suspects, Japanese beetles, cicadas, uh, gypsy moths, gall wasps, which are pretty specific to chestnuts, and then leaf hoppers. 
couple of the things that you can do uh, to protect your orchard is to maintain tree health. Again, um, is, are they getting adequate water? Are they getting adequate light? Um, is there, are there damaged branches from wind or ice? Can you remove those? Um, stressed trees are more susceptible. Orchard maintenance, uh, manage those weeds, whether you mow them or spray. Um, they can harbor insects. Scouting. So go out and walk in your orchard. Don't just go out there um, at harvest time. Uh, take a look and see what's going on. Um, if you find egg masses, for example, for gypsy moths, uh, you can remove those. You can use pesticides. Um, and biological controls um, can be used. Uh, parasitic wasps have been uh, proven effective. Um, against gall wasps and uh, BT for the gypsy moths and other um, larvae. One of the, the curses of chestnut people is the chestnut weevil. And I have a number of stories about um, weevils emerging at inopportune times. Um, cold storage in my kitchen, in my refrigerator, really horrified my children. Leaving chestnuts on a college a colleague's desk over the weekend is not a way to make friends because chestnut weevils are, are ubiquitous. And their larvae look like really chunky little maggots. But there is an easy way to control them, if not defeat them. You treat those um, chestnuts, you harvest them daily. So make sure, again, um, sanitation is, clean, is key. Harvest those chestnuts every day. Um, and then treat them in a hot water bath at 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. So that will kill the egg or the emerging larva of the um, chestnut weevil but the germ or the, the embryonic um, tree in the nut um, does not, it doesn't kill that. So that's a way of um, preparing your chestnuts for storage or for sale. Again, um, good sanitation, apply seven at 10 day intervals beginning in mid-August. That's when the large and the small uh, chestnut weevils begin to fly and Avaposit in the um, developing chestnuts. Uh, I'm going to talk about a chestnut grower by the name of Greg Miller later on, but Greg's, Greg's statement was loud and clear when he said, customers' tolerance for chestnut weevils is zero. So he both heat treats and sprays um, his chestnut orchards. And I don't know if you've had the experience, I've actually been in a grocery store where there were weevil holes in, in the chestnuts they offered, which was a little disconcerting. So you don't want to do that for your customers or your family. Chestnut blight, of course, is the number one disease. Um, and then uh, ink disease, or uh, it's a phytophthora, is also a, a, a concern for chestnuts, that's one of the uh, main reasons you don't want to grow chestnuts in uh, clay soils, poorly drained soils, um, wet soils. So what can you do? Uh, the chestnut blight is ubiquitous, it's here, um, it's not going away. Um, it um, is also found in uh, scarlet oak, so there um, are, it harbors the, the um, fungus. So even though, even if we have all of our chestnuts are resistant, it, there's potential for the, the disease to hang on. So number one, uh, select resistant material from certified for sources. So make sure where you're getting your, um, your chestnuts, uh, are they resistant? Are you looking for a, a Chinese cross, Japanese cross, something that, that confers some level of resistance to the blight. Um, maybe they're, they're the American chestnut hybrids. Um, but 
Um, make sure that you've got disease resistant material. Make sure of your source. You know, we, we, we tend to swap a lot of materials. Um, tree enthusiasts are kind of like that. But we have to be really careful when we're moving materials around because um, there are diseases that can be transmitted in soil that can um, readily damage your orchard. Orchard sanitation, remove um, those leaves, remove uh, damaged branches, just keep the, um, the sources um, out, of, out of your orchard. And again, uh, as always, maintain optimum growing conditions. Uh, keep those trees healthy. They'll be more resistant to disease overall. One of the fun facts, one of the fun things um, that we found about chestnuts is um, something we call mud packing. And as I mentioned before, the chestnut is um, re-sprouts even though it dies to the ground because there is an antagonistic organism in the soil. Um, some folks have um, postulated that it's the um, trichoderma, but we're not quite certain. Nonetheless, there's an antagonistic organism in the soil that inhibits the um, chestnut blight. So it'll, it'll re-sprout. So if you have a canker on a tree that you can reach and you want to save that tree for some um, time, it's not going to, it's not a cure because the cankers may form anywhere in the tree that are, and especially places that aren't accessible. But if you take soil at the base of that tree, pack it up, um, mix it with water and force it into that canker, then wrap that canker up. Then the tree will um, start to ward off or um, wall off that blight and can heal to some extent. Again, it's not a, a panacea, but it's a way to save a tree for a while. So you're growing chestnuts, you're protecting your chestnuts, you're watering your chestnuts, you've selected them, and now what? So what can you do with them? Um, you can sell them fresh, roasted, frozen, or raw. You can make chestnut flour. Um, dried chestnuts are, can be rehydrated um, and used in cooking. Um, chestnut purees, chestnut honey, beers. And you can sell seedlings and cyan wood as well. Um, you come up with a, a cultivar that is really successful, and um, you might consider um, selling that it, as well. Um, but where would you sell it? So farm stands and farm markets, restaurants, wholesale, and online. So there are a number of different um, outlets. And one of the things that I, I read and heard universally when I was looking at um, chestnut production is that the producers tend to sell out every year. So there, there is plenty of demand, even nationally, if not internationally, for chestnuts that are grown here uh, in Pennsylvania. So on that note, I want to talk uh, about um, the Route 9 Cooperative in Carrollton, Ohio. I've got a little time here, so I'm going to rush through this. But um, this is the farmer. This is Dr. Greg Miller. I mentioned him earlier. He, his father started planting different nut trees and different um, fruit producers in uh, the 1950s. In 1972, um, Greg and his father planted 500 chestnut trees um, on their farm, and that transition became Empire Chestnuts. So when Greg came back from college in the 1980s, the trees were already well into production and he started selling chestnuts. So here is an example of um, Dr. Miller's orchard. One of the interesting things that he's found is how the soil has improved. There's much more organic matter in the soil. And he's seen um, oh, hawks and different wildlife in here he has not seen before. And this form of 
perennial agriculture produces an income, but it also um, produces habitat. So while Greg was growing chestnuts, he uh, was harvesting chestnuts, he was also growing them. And one of the, the larger parts of his business is to sell seedlings, which he did. The land surrounding um, Empire Chestnuts is, was largely slated for mining. And the, the operators that own the property opted not to mine the coal that was underlain, but instead decided that they would plant chestnuts to build, um, uh, enhance the land, and then sell it to hunters, which they did. Ironically, they bought their chestnuts from Greg Miller. They saw what he was doing. They said, hey, that's a great idea. And so Greg had a ready uh, market right next door and sold the operators thousands of chestnuts and then the operators sold the land and people who wanted to hunt bought the land. But over time, there it was clear there was a market. Um, Greg started buying chestnuts from his neighbors in order to meet demand. And over time, this developed into um, a co-op. So there are nine growers that got together and combined resources and got grants and built this uh, Route 9 co-op. What's really um, very interesting is this, this operation is a community operation. Um, the, the owners reached out to the local community, um, engineers helped design, um, for example, this sorting um, tunnel, if you will, um, at the far end are small holes. And as you move forward, the holes get larger. So they automatically sort the chestnuts by size. Here is um, a really fun piece of um, equipment. This is the hot tub for the, the chestnuts for the heat treating. But again, uh, something sort of unique to this um, uh, operation. So there's a lot of literature out there about co-ops and how they work. Um, some of the things the grower members establish cooperatives to combine resources, expertise, and efforts. Not all of us know how to grow um, trees, but we might know how to market trees. We might know how um, have some understanding of tax law. We might understand something about um, uh, food safety. So we can all bring these different skills, but they can also reduce the barriers to becoming or remaining a chestnut grower. Um, the Route 9 Co-op actually hires somebody full time to do the mowing, to do the spraying um, in the summer. Um, they hire someone to manage the, the, the laborers that um, come. And I mentioned that this is a community operation. Uh, folks start calling uh, in August to ask uh, the cooperative when they're going to be ready to harvest nuts because um, local neighbors, um, there's a large Amish community within the, the area. Um, folks will come in and harvest nuts off the ground, as well as um, school groups. So for a fundraiser, they'll pick five gallon buckets of chestnuts at $11 um, a bucket, and then um, use that money for, for trips or whatever. So they bring the community in. Um, folks are very aware it's part of the operation. However, uh, as the operation grows and they produce more nuts and um, far more land, uh, Greg's concerned that they're going to have to move to a, a more um, uh, equipment-based harvesting system. So, but right now it's, it's all done by hand. Um, finally, some of the, the Route 9 cooperative members are absentee farmers. Uh, the land's in production. 
the, the co-op handles all the details, and at the end of the day, the landowner um, receives a portion of the, the um, return. I mentioned earlier resources and references, uh, growing chestnut trees, again, the Northern Nut Growers Association, if you don't know about them, look into them if you're interested in nuts. Um, there's a lot of knowledge out there, um, and they certainly can help you with cultivar selection, um, and if you're interested in other species, uh, those as well. Um, Growing Chinese Chestnuts in Missouri, that publication is available online. It has a detailed list of operations and schedules. It also has um, a, a budget. So in a, a budget for establishment, what's it going to cost for you to establish? Now, be mindful that these things are based uh, on experiences in Missouri, but could be adapted to what we do here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Pennsylvania New Jersey chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, these folks have planted tens of thousands of trees in Pennsylvania. Uh, they have a lot of knowledge about chestnut culture. Um, and if you're interested in looking in, uh, into co-op um, opportunities, uh, the growing uh, Midwestern tree nut businesses, there are five case studies, and they can uh, give you a lot of information, uh, food for thought, if you're thinking about forming a co-op. That said, if you look at these sources, I mean, two of them are from the Midwest. Um, the bulk of the, the chestnuts produced in this country are produced in California, a lot of them in the Midwest, in Missouri, Iowa, Michigan. Um, there's no reason why uh, we can't join that um, uh, industry and grow chestnuts here in Pennsylvania. This is prime chestnut country. So with that, uh, thank you. And... Uh, Appreciate you taking the time to sit in and listen. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, that was an amazing, amazing presentation. Um, I learned a lot about chestnuts today that I never knew their history and especially about the diseases. That was, uh, it's amazing how much is out there that can um, affect <clears throat> the production. We have one question that came in, and folks, I forgot to mention at the beginning, if you have questions, please type them in the question uh, box um, on the side of your screen, and we can feed those back to Tracy. The question that came in about halfway through, Tracy, when you were showing photographs of uh, orchards, was that the trees, the seedlings specifically, look um, like they're a lot closer than 30 to 40 feet apart. Can you explain what's going on there? Oh, that's a good question. I, I am not, that, it's an honestly a good question. I'm, I'm assuming what they're going to do after the trees come into production is to thin them. So that's one of the strategies um, that is mentioned. So uh, putting them that close together, what's going to happen is there, some of those trees are going to shade each other out. And so the production is going to be um, reduce. So that would be my guess, is that the intention is to, um, is to thin them. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense to me. Anybody else have any questions uh, for Tracy at this time? Okay, well, Tracy, it seems like you were extremely thorough in your description of growing and producing uh, marketing chestnuts, and we're getting folks saying thank you. Oh, that was Michael who had originally asked the question about um, the how the trees were spaced. So uh, without further ado, I think that we can probably... Um, yep, we're getting lots of thank yous. We can probably wrap up here. Anything else you want to say? Tracy, for the good of the order, before we... Oh, just real quick, a little Pennsylvania history here, that tree on the upper left. That was planted in northern Michigan in 1909 by a Pennsylvania um, railroad man. Hmm. And that tree at that time was about 100 years old. 
and uh, it escaped the blight, but the blight's there now. But it was just indicative of how beautiful the trees could be. Anyway. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, and I just wa also wanted to mention to the group, Tracy and I had a conversation before, and Tracy has a couple questions for you folks that we're going to send out in an email follow-up, um, specifically regarding developing cooperatives here in Pennsylvania and other marketing um, ideas. So keep an eye out for that. And if you can help us uh, by answering those questions, we'll really appreciate it because Tracy didn't really mention it, but she is working on um, in this in agroforestry on a broader scale and bringing that to Pennsylvania in a really big way. So thank you, Tracy. And thanks everyone for joining us. All right. Thanks.